Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of the Sell More Book Show episode 526. I'm Brian Cohen from Best Page Forward, joined by the the co-founder of Inker's Con, seven-time New York Times best-selling author Alessandra Torre. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. I'm great. And if you don't recognize Alessandra, you might recognize me under A.R. Tori. That's my suspense pen name. Um, yes, and yes. And I am so excited to be here and chatting uh, and chatting with you today. All about yeah. audible categories and keywords. I know, I know. It's dun, dun, dun. really fun. I've never, like, I love when we find out stuff that I'd never heard of because it's really <laughs> fun to talk about it on the program. Um how how much do you do you do uh, audio books? Do you get them commissioned yourself? Do you sell your audio rights? How do you do that, Alessandra? I do. So um, I the, my first like six books I sold audio. I you mm -hmm. know I was a, mm -hmm. a newbie author. This is like 2013. My agent was like, "Hey, we already have an offer on so and so. Do you want it?" And I was like, "Sure." Those were like the biggest mistakes I ever made. I sold oh. all of my audio books at the time. My books were doing fantastically well. My books were hitting New York Times list. My books were were just like going gangbusters, and I was selling my audio rights for like two or three thousand dollars, like maybe oh, four thousand no. dollars. Oh no! Yeah, and if I had kept those, and like, I mean, but I didn't know. Like, I was like, right. oh, free money, and most of those because they took like six months to be produced. I I don't know that I earned back my advance on a, on maybe one of them. Ugh. The rest I did not. So now, though, seven years has passed. So I'm starting to get those rights back. Um, so uh, I started self-publishing my own audio like 2014 or 15. And um, and then I moved everything. I used to be uh, Amazon exclusive. I moved everything over to Find Away Voices mm -hmm, mm -hmm. three or four years ago. Um, and then my last few books, which are under AR, Tori, those were all with Thomas and Mercer. So those all have audio handled by them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and those all are, the audio is also free to KU readers. Um, yeah. and so I get, those do fantastic because of that. So I get, oh, yeah, awesome. I get a nice little chunk of change from those. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, audio and promotion has always been a, an interesting thing. It seemed like we were heading in the direction of, of, oh, there's finally going to be an audible competitor. And then obviously find a way in the Spotify contract and lots of stuff lots has of gotten in the way of that. But but we'll see what comes next. And we will talk about, I feel like we keep being too far away for an official segue. So let's just go to the question of the week here from a couple of weeks back, which was what productivity hacks have helped you get more done? Lorna said, walking, gardening, commuting, anything mundane. I've been dictating since 1990. Uh, the coolest thing is that I never know exactly what's around the next corner as I'm walking and dictating, but I have faith that the words will come and they always do. I love that, Lorna. Amy Martinson, author, said, I'm such a programmed list maker that if it gets on the list, it will get done. Uh, I highlight the things that are daunting in bright pink. Nothing like a page of bright pink stripes at the end of the day um, or when she marks them off, they're bright pink. And then Logan Russell said, I write every day on my train ride to and from work. It's a usually distraction-free environment and having a set amount of time helps me get, to my, get my thoughts out faster and not have to worry too much about word choice. If I ever become a full-time writer, I'll still write. I'll still ride the train somewhere for the productivity boost. I love that. Love. Uh, Alessandra, what productivity hacks have helped you to get more done? Well, I am a horrible multitasker um, <laughs> and it's really hard for me to turn that off when I start to write. Like it's, you know, I'm like, oh, I'll just do this in this real fast while I'm doing this. And so for me, it's two things. One, now when I have something I have to do, I go down and I actually put it as like an appointment on my calendar. So if I'm like, oh, I know I need to send out an email on, you know, the first I'll put on on my calendar the day before you know, at two o'clock, you know, to write email, whatever else. So that way it's like, oh, it's like an appointment with myself. And that mm -hmm. I'll set aside the time to do that. Um, the other thing is like, once I started, now I'm really married to my calendar. Like if it's on my calendar, like I'll be there. If it's not on my calendar, I, like 
it's not, I'm not even aware of it. It doesn't zone. exist. It's, it's not yeah. even a thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when I, whenever I don't show up for something, I'm like, it wasn't on my calendar. Like I, I feel like we talked about it yesterday. I'm like, I know, but I told you I needed it on my calendar. Um, so the other thing that I do is when I'm writing, I write at um, like starting at 10 p.m., 11 p.m. at night, mm -hmm, and then I'll mm -hmm. write till two or three in the morning. And that's the only time my email isn't going crazy. No one's texting me. I can put, I can turn my phone off. I can turn off Wi-Fi, you know, um, and I just like use a Spotify playlist that's already downloaded. And I also use, if you're listening, you won't be able to see this, but I bought one of these. It's a, yeah. <laughs> the free write oh um, yeah, yeah 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 and uh and it syncs with via wi-fi to my mm -hmm. um to my computer and it's just like i can just type away i can actually go back and edit something if i mess something up but i try not to and yeah um, and i and um the screen is like a kindle screen so i can sit outside and do it oh, um, nice. so yeah. that was really nice it's a little heavy the battery yeah device. i have one of those i haven't taken it out of the box yet yeah. <laughs> I got like the original, like the newer yeah. one. The, then then the I Neo oh, like, too, the Neo, the Neo. Yeah, those yeah. old school ones. I had those. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Good hacks. Good yeah. hacks there. Um, thank you. Uh let's now segue, now that we're not segueing, <laughs> let's segue into the top story of the week. Audible category secrets. Did you know? There's a little advertised way you can get your audiobook placed into up to three categories and add three keyword phrases to your book's metadata as search terms. It's true. And Dave Chesson has detailed the process to find the best categories and keywords in his latest article on Kindlepreneur. Since there are over 200 categories on Audible, it's possible to choose those with less competition for big name authors who dominate the broader categories. Chesson's article explains how to find these less competitive categories and keywords manually using an Audible search or automatically using Publisher Rocket, which also gives information about historical sales uh, and how much you'd need to sell to compete in that category. Quote, a solid story with a good narrator can turn an audiobook listener into a fan of your work, says Chesson, but in order for Audible listeners to find your audiobook, you need to make sure it's discoverable by picking the right categories for your book, end quote. To learn how to find and set your Audible categories and keywords. So you can check out the article in our show notes. Alessandra, I didn't know about this. Did you know about this? I did not know about this at all. And I'm curious if it's only for ACX. Like Ooh, if, yeah, I don't know. If it's done through ACX. But even even like I'm wide and I still am published on ACX. Right. So I, it must be. That's, yeah, every, everyone up there on it. Um, yeah. No, yeah. but I love this. I'm really excited about this. Um, yeah. It's always fun to, to go down the rabbit hole for these things. Yeah. I'm trying to think how I'll pick my keywords and categories. I think I'm I'm guessing Dave's tool will do double duty. So I have yeah. to block it. Well, I know with metadata for the ebooks, my my strategy is always, and this helps tends to help the Amazon ads too, mm -hmm. is to find keywords that when you search them on Amazon, books that are similar to yours come up. Yeah. Uh, for those seven KDP keyword metadata phrases, I reckon it'd be the same kind of thing. You'd want the same audiobooks to show up if you search that term plus audiobook or something like that. But uh, but yeah, no, exciting times. I think there's so much. I know this isn't my next question for you, but there's that's okay. So, there's so much op, not opportunities. Kind of the wrong word. I am I am beyond flustered at how inept <laughs> audiobook recommendations are. Like, oh um, my gosh, yeah. in my other life, I work with Authors AI, and we work with the book discovery, like AI yeah. did book discovery. And so I had meetings with Spotify. This was before like the Spotify drama with Find Away Voices. I had meetings with Spotify right when they brought audiobooks in. Yeah, and I was like, okay, so our technology can read a book, or an audiobook transcript and say, okay, this is like the DNA of this book and what other books or audiobooks are like this book in terms of storyline, pacing, like how the story is told, writing style, blah, blah, blah. So one of the things that Spotify does so well is like, I'm listening to this song by Old Dominion. I'm like, oh, I love this. And it's like, oh, here's a song that you never would have found on your own that is very similar, right? And so- yeah. And that was one of the things that I think really caused like their success. So it was like, if, if we can do that with songs, let's do the same thing with 
audiobooks. Let's not use metadata or buyer behavior. Let's look at the book and say, okay, what books or audiobooks are like this book in terms of the story and experience? And so at that point in time, I ask a lot of questions about how they recommend audiobooks and things like that. And, and if I wanted to do advertising on Spotify and advertise my audiobook, what were my targets? If yeah. I want, if I go to Spotify right now and I say, well, this was like six months or a year ago, sure, but sure, I don't sure. think they've changed anything. And I was like, I want to spend a million dollars marketing my audiobook on Spotify. How can I market my audiobook? I can choose a category. They have like <laughs> seven categories and only one oh, of them geez. is like books. Okay. The rest are like podcasts or like birds or something. <laughs> there is no tar targeting or segmentation at all. Like it's, yeah. And they're not, and I know they're not making intelligent recommendations based on their audiobook. So it's like ridiculous. It, they're strictly using metadata and, yeah. um, and what is provided by the author. So off on that tangent, my point is, I think <laughs> there's so much potential because right now, really, I feel like readers are just finding their audiobooks based on using book resources right. and, and book sites and say, you know, and they're looking for a book on Amazon and then they're like, okay. I'll, you know, I found this book. Now let me see if it's available in audio. Yeah. I mean, it, so, it's, it's weird. It's like, and, and having worked with Amazon ads and, and doing stuff with them and, and, and obviously promoting, you know, the five day challenge and everything. It's like, wouldn't it, wouldn't you guys like it if your service worked better and they're like, and they're and like, no, some... that seems like too yeah. much work. Yeah, like... no, we're going to keep doing it the way we're going to do it. But thanks for the input. Yeah. Uh, uh... Well, let me ask you, speaking about promoting audiobooks. Sure, sure, what, sure. What other marketing strategies other than keywords and categories are good to promote audiobooks in your in your opinion? So I think that oh. when you sell the ebook, you tend to sell more of the audiobook. And so you definitely need to look at, because there's so few, there's like far too few ways to yeah. promote audiobook. I know there are like chirp promotions if you're in yeah. that marketplace, which is great if you can get them. It's like book bub feature deals. It's great yeah. if you can get them, but if you can't get them or you can't do a, a promo like a Kobo audiobook promotion or something like that, if you can't get those, then what do you do? You sell more of the ebook. Because if you sell more of the ebook, you're going to sell more of the audiobook to people who actually want the book in audio. And so you look to things that sell your particular eBooks. Well, I am a big fan of this idea that if you like doing something, you'll get better at it and you'll actually spend time on it. And so find something you enjoy doing that just so happens to sell books, then yeah. get to be like as amazing as you possibly can at it. And then supplement that with other things like email marketing and, and Amazon ads and Facebook ads. But that's the thing. It's like, if you dislike the thing that you're learning in a course or whatever, you're not ever going to do it. So you might as well just go back to what works a little bit, but get really good at it. Yeah, I love that. I love that advice. And I think there is, there's definitely room if somebody could figure out a way, I think there are authors that would love to throw money at, at, at promoting their audio book. But it's yeah. like you said, there's so few venues. Like you could run a Facebook ad. So how do Amazon ads work with audio? Like you can't run them. You can't. Oh, you, you can't. can't. And like, we've had some people who we've seen, they have like the beta, but the yeah. beta, like it's been going on for years. They don't care. They're not going to do yeah. anything with it. And which is so silly. Yeah. It's so, cause you hear about people, I'm friends with Chris Box. He used to advertise the heck out of his audiobook trilogy, like the full, the full trilogy on Audible and these like 30 hour, 40 hour e audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And he, he would crush it with those. And if you could do that with Amazon ads, it would be so beneficial, but they're, they haven't done it yet. Yeah, I do think there's really kind of the only like market potential is if you're selling audiobooks direct, which is yep. a customer hurdle in itself, you know, but yes. if you're selling audiobooks direct, then you've got the flexibility to, to do a, you know, a freemium to, you know, you've got the profit margin where you can spend money, but 
Yeah. It's it's you still have the reader who's like, oh, this looks great. This looks great. Oh, wait, I have to create an account on this author's website and download it and try to figure out how to listen to it. Like, mm, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, no, there's still hurdles there. And <laughs> I like selling direct as well. But, you know, a lot of people struggle with the technology. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Let's move into the lightning round. I'm going to make a lightning sound because I haven't done one in a while. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one, too. Ooh, I like that. It, like, had a little sizzle after. Yeah. Well, um, you need to be, like, flicking the light switch when you do that. I have a story about that. But <laughs> um, I did it for a play once, and people <laughs> people cheered after I did it because I did it so well. So I was I was really happy about Step that in it college. Up. You got to add yeah. some, yeah. Yeah, you got to add Visual effects to the show. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Uh, well, we'll have those things, like, you can do on uh, FaceTime now, or if you do the right hand gestures, it'll, like, make a light show behind you. Yes, we, we can exactly. do that. Um, Alessandra, when Authors AI came out four years ago, there wasn't much talk about AI. It wasn't a thing, but now it's been really contentious about the AI. A lot of people have opinions about it. So how do you think authors feel right now about having like software analyzing, uh, their book yeah. structure? Yeah. I love this question. Um, yeah. And it was interesting because I was just talking to someone yesterday about this and, um, and it was like when Authors AI came out, like you said, four years ago, like nobody, everyone was like, oh, that's interesting. Like AI books, like what, what are you doing now? AI is such this like polarizing word that a lot of times we had to have to overcome, you mm -hmm. know, like how we're using AI. And I think it's what, you know, it's almost like a reeducation because there's um, generative AI, which could potentially be used in the future to write books. And then there's analytical AI and how we're using yeah. AI is the same way that AI has historically been. It's doing a job better th that a human literally cannot do. It is reading, you know, a hundred thousand words in a period of minutes and analyzing the DNA of that story and then comparing it to a million other stories, you know. And so our AI is kind of like a super librarian, you know. Yeah. And when you walk into a bookstore and you're like, hey, I love Gone Girl, like what's similar to it? You're dealing with that person's very limited ability to recommend books based on what they have read and their personal taste, you know, right, where right. an AI could say, oh, <laughs> this book is 92% <laughs> similar to Gone Girl, you know, um, and or if they were like, I want Gone Girl, but I want it in the writing style of Stephen King. It's like, <laughs> here you go. Or I want Gone Girl, but set in space. That's yeah. something a computer can do that a human just. They just can't read enough books and, and then they have personal biases. So um, I don't think I've answered your question. How do readers, <laughs> how do authors feel about AI analyzing the books? Uh, it's, it is, it depends on the author. Yep. And I think yep. it is, and authors should be very wary of an AI analyzing their book because depending on the company that is doing that, that an analysis can be used in different ways. Mm. Um, so it's really important to know who is analyzing your books and what that and whether that is like kind of a closed environment, like we operate on our system. We're not connected yeah. to chat GPT or any large language models. So when we do a Marlowe analysis, the author can choose. I want this to I want this to contribute to your training library or I don't, you know, um, and if they say I don't, then all that data is deleted. But again, we're yeah. not training a generative AI. So um, but. There are so many resources out there, including like Grammarly and big, big companies that when you are uploading your book, you don't know what is happening to the data that is associated with that book. And it's really mm. important for us to become smarter and smarter with the contracts that we're signing and understanding what permissions we're giving up um, for our books. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it makes sense. And it's good. Uh, good to know that it's kind of just in this. A little closed box to avoid yeah. for, for mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the things that authors are worried about. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. You got a question for question me. Question for you. You are always looking to grow. How do you see Best Page Forward changing in the next five to 10 years? So um, I am definitely wondering what will happen in, with Best Page Forward World in the next five to 10 years. Um, we are we used to just kind of cater to beginners uh, and uh, but I didn't realize that we really haven't been catering to exact beginners with zero books. We're, we're catering to 
really people with two, three or more books. And so in the last year, as I've started coaching higher end authors, authors earning over $2,500 a month in my Pathfinders program, and then the agency for authors earning over $6,000 a month, like we've started catering to authors who are already on the way to full time. But while I want to keep expanding that, because that's been such a success and I've been really happy with the authors we've been able to help. I also have this idea of maybe catering to true beginners, people with zero books or one books, uh, because, you know, some while we've helped over 30,000 authors learn about the ads, we really do want to help people who maybe aren't even ready for ads as well to to get a better idea of writing from the beginning. But what if you could reach a, an author who's got zero books out and have their process incorporate writing to market from the beginning. Yeah. That is kind of the direction that I'm looking at for 20, 2027 and beyond, I suppose. Well, the one thing I deal with a lot of new authors um, in all in all of the different businesses. Um, and yeah. one thing that I consistently hear over and over again, and then a lot of times Best Page Forward is mentioned like, oh, I think Best Page Forward is doing some of that is they want they want really a i have they they have this book yeah and they don't know what to do with it right and they really need like a non predatory company yeah. that will just sit, like we'll format it for you we'll write the book description we'll help you work with a cover designer and we will get it published for you you know what yeah. i mean and we won't yeah. take your rights and we won't whatever like they just they want to just give their money to somebody so that they don't have to go through this whole learning curve because right. they're not sure they're going to write another book. Like for a lot of them, it's like, I'm, I'm seeing how this is and what this world is like. And this, the learning curve of everything I have to go through, like, like they just aren't sure, especially like, and a lot of these are retired, like they have yeah. money to invest. They just don't know where to put it, you know? And I'll be like, oh, you know, we'll go, you know, to Best Page Forward for the blurb or go here for the cover. And the minute I get like more than two steps, they're like. Too much. Know. Yeah, too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's tough. And then you've got big, big, big companies like selfpublishing.com yeah. will be like, yeah, we'll do it for 10 yeah. grand. And it's... I talk to people all the time. They spent three, four, eight grand, mm -hmm. you know, and. And the best case scenario is if they just paid that for them to handle the details and they didn't take their rights. The worst, the more common thing is, is they paid rights, $5,000 yeah. and the company is getting like 20% or 50% mm -hmm. of that while they like pay it back or something. I don't know. It's like ridiculous. Not good. Yeah. Not good. But to segue. <laughs> so as a, <laughs> these segues have been. Rough, but that's okay. We're, we're right. going to get there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more like the, you know, the founder of the Segway falling <laughs> off the Segway. Um, so as a serial entrepreneur, you recently purchased a coffee shop called Baby's Coffee in Key West. How is running a coffee shop different from your other ventures? Oh, it's totally different. Um, yeah. In part because I was... <laughs> So we so we own a so Baby's Coffee has been around 33 years. It's a roastery and coffee shop. So we have mm -hmm. like an iconic location outside of Key West, and then we roast coffee and we have a mail order business. And it's the first business that me and my husband have been in that it's a consumable product. Like I'm used yep. to writing a book, and it doesn't matter if a million people buy that book or 10 people buy that book. Like same amount of work on my end. Yeah, so this is the first time it's like, oh, if a million people buy a pound of coffee, like we have to roast a million pounds coffee and bag it and package it and send it out and do you like there's work associated with every single sale. And that for both of us was like, I mean, we knew that there like every rest, like every other industry is like this, but for us, it was like, what? Wait, yeah. <laughs> like you never catch up. You never, ever catch up. Like we have a great day of sales and it's like, great. We're going to have to get up at six in the morning and, you know, be there and do it all over again. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, um, so that was, was hard for me. Um, but it's, it's something I love, like, it's just a different part of our brain. And, um, and it's dealing with people, you know, writing is such a solitary activity. And so much of my life is on zoom and everything else. So um, being there and 
being in person and seeing people every morning and it's, you know, it's a place people come in and feel happier when they're there. So that's really cool. I love it. That's awesome. I used to work at a Starbucks. So. Oh, you did. You know, yeah. Brings me I back. Totally Bring... see you at a Starbucks. Like, oh, you, yeah. Like Dude, people loved, people happy. freaking loved me on Saturday and Sunday at 6 a.m. Yeah. They were happy to see me. Yeah. They I were happy to see A hundred percent. Yeah. So um, you've got a question for me. Got I two do left. have a question for you. Um, how should other. How should authors consider other business opportunities when they arise? Do you think me buying a coffee shop was a stupid idea? No, I don't think that you buying a coffee shop was a stupid idea. I think I think that authors should be open to these ideas because as you grow your own business, you realize, oh, I don't have to just do what I'm doing forever. I used to be the blurb guy. And that was all I did. And I would write them myself. I would do all of them, every single one. And then I realized, you know, I don't know if I want to always be the blurb guy. So I hired a team and now I don't touch the blurbs. But, you know, then I wanted to be a teacher and teach more. And so got into the ads teaching. And like, there was a lot of different opportunities for me personally. But if you're an author out there who's seeing other opportunities, seeing ways to be enterprising, like, you would be amazed how good it feels to get paid like a couple hundred bucks rather than just three bucks for yeah. a book. And so it's like, you know, be open, be open to these ideas because uh, like they might not be a good fit and you, you eventually have to make that decision, but be open to it because you never know what can happen. And I do want to add on to that and say, I was talking to a, a, a bit an author that was making I'd say three or four hundred thousand dollars a year off books mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. she was wanting to go into the teaching space and courses and blah 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 mm. and, I, and I said to her I said I remember when COVID hit or something there was a time where I was so grateful because I had my courses and I had like that that steady income that didn't the pressure was off my books it didn't matter if my books failed with right but, right Moving into that area, into that business, looking back and now it, yeah. it significantly, I I was on this like trajectory and it immediately went like that. Like, mm. like it, it sucks up so much of your time. It, it divides yeah. your brain, you know, like if it has to be a passion of yours and you have to love it and you have to enjoy doing it. Um, and, but you have to be aware that you can't do everything like, and writing takes up so much time. I went from writing four books a year. I write one book a year now, you know? So it's just, you have to say, is this something that I am okay with the consequences of this? And do I think that the benefits will outweigh those consequences? Yeah. And she ended up not going into, she's like, Oh yeah, yeah. I think it'll be fine. But she has since not done it. So I think that's smart that she didn't do it. And I think that was good advice for you to give. I mean, last kind of question here with all the things you have going on and, and this could be helpful for other authors trying to think of the same, same question. How do you make time for writing when you have so many projects? I have to have a deadline and, and thank God mm-hmm. I'm under publisher contract right now because <laughs> I, I learned this from Becca Smine. Like I realized I'm deadline motivated. Like if I yeah. don't have a deadline, it's not going to happen. It's like, it's just not going to get done. I'll be like, Oh, I got to write that book. I got to write that book. If I don't have an editor or a contract that is forcing me to stick to a certain time frame, it's not going to happen. So yeah. Um, yeah. So I have got to have a deadline and then I let my family and friends know about it. And they just know that for the next two months, like they're not going to see me. Yeah. Um, so. Well, I mean, setting deadlines for yourself seems pretty smart. If you don't have a publisher person breathing down your neck, um, deadlines definitely help me as well Ooh. for what it's worth. But um, we need a question of the week here. Alessandra, what do you think? Question of the week is, do you think text message marketing is still effective? And if so, how have you used it to success? Okay. How have you used it to success? You thinking about this for baby coffee? <laughs> no, I'm, I, I've been, I have it for my books and I send it out when I have a new book, but I don't, I feel like the authors aren't utilizing it. I don't know if it's because they're not getting the ROI. 
I think it's because authors don't know about it. Because I think text message marketing is crazy powerful. But that's mm-hmm. that's my personal. But it's not cheap. Thought. It's, no, not, it's cheap, not cheap. So it's not cheap. Yeah. This is true. This and is it's true. It's hard to get readers to part with that email address and yeah. with that phone number. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Well, thank you, Alessandra. It's been great having you. I hope people will go to inkerscon.com and go go think about going to that event. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for having me on and chatting with me. I love talking shop. Yeah, no, likewise, likewise. Well, I'll be back next week, everybody, uh, with another guest co-host. So thank you for listening. Big thank you to Alessandra for being here today. Hi, right, everybody. Uh, go sell more books. Go sell more books for Alessandra. I'm Brian. Have a great week of book selling, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.